What's up, Denarians and Faye? This is Stephen and Ben bringing you our latest Dresden Files review. This is book 10, Small Favor by Jim Butcher. So how's it going, Ben? What do you think of this one? Yeah, I mean, I liked it. I think we talked about it a little bit last time. We were just marginally getting a little bit better each book here. So I thought that this book was no exception. Um, and yeah, I enjoyed it. I'd have to say this is one of my top Dresden books. I mean, we talk about changes quite a bit because a lot of stuff happens there and it obviously changes things. It's, it's happily named. But this one, I think it is one of the more cohesive narratives. There's a lot going on, but also keeps you engaged you know, the entire time, obviously, um, if there's a lot going on. But uh, th there's really no like dead weight here. Um, it, it's, it's pretty lean and it, it reads really well. And it's also got uh, some some nice, uh, big climactic action as well. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. So um, I think that there's going to be a lot of uh, good discussions here with it. So yeah, and I think we're just going to kind of get right into this one. We'll keep this review shorter. If you like Phantology, check us out on social media at Phantology Books online at www.phantologybooks.com. We just started a new thing where we are going to alert you guys of upcoming recordings on Twitter, Discord, whatever. And then if it's something that uh, grabs your interest, go ahead and send us in like a voice memo or a comment or question or quote, really whatever. We want you to be part of the recordings. And if we get some good stuff, we will do our best to respond to those things or even include your recording in our recording. But that said, let's go into small favor so um if, if you're familiar with dresden files already you kind of know what to expect here as far as uh, as far as content and and this one's pretty much the same and as we get into the plot so we start off right away with kind of a fun scene at the carpenters where they're doing some uh, they're having a snowball fight and molly is using learning to use defensive magic in kind of this fun way where all of our younger siblings are throwing snowballs at her. So it's fun because you have this familial setting and you can tell how comfortable everyone is with each other and it's a snowball fight. And then there's also, um, there's also magic happening as, as well. So, um, so, so that's fun. And I thought it was a really nice way to integrate the known of, uh, you know, a, a family setting, but also you have this unknown portion of, of the world with, with magic going on. Yeah, I, I think that uh, it's interesting because um, the, we see we see Molly being trained by having snowballs thrown at her. At first, you're like, oh man, that's kind of like a crummy way to you know learn magic. Like if you've ever been hit in the face with a snowball, it doesn't exactly feel good. But then we get kind of get this um, this look into Harry's view where like his mentor used baseballs on him, you know. And so it kind of shows you the difference between like Harry, like Harry's like finding fun ways to, you know, the stakes are still there, but it's, it's more of a fun, lighthearted way to learn, to learn magic from Molly. So I thought that was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. And it shows you the difference between Harry's upbringing, which was a little harsher than Molly's. And it also shows you how awesome the Carpenter family is. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, and then, you know, the action just picks up right away with, uh, with these gruff things. Yeah, so. the, yeah, the gruffs come in. So gruffs are creatures of fae. These are like your billy goat gruffs, right? With the, the whole thing with the bridge, and they progressively get larger. So this was a fun way that that butcher interweaved a classic fairy tale into the story. So they they jump in, they they start fighting everyone, and Molly and Charity team up with Harry to ward them off. And Harry starts to speculate, okay, what's going on here? Um, he thinks that maybe it's some fallout from the whole attack uh, that can prove his proven guilty in Arctic's tour. Uh, but then Bob tells him that actually, no, the Gruffs are summer fey, not winter fey. So yeah, there, there's, a, there's a mystery here. But before we investigate this one too much, Murphy calls in Harry for a different case. There is a destroyed building that's, that's happened. So, so we're investigating. There appears to be some, some magical things going on here. And Harry finds this pentagram, and we also learned that the building is owned by Mark Cohn, so things are already picking up and, and several different factions are, are coming into play. 
Yeah. 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 So um, whenever Marcon is, is mentioned, I kind of get a little bit excited because I think he's probably one of the characters I'm more interested in. So, um, yeah, so I enjoyed that. I, I also enjoyed the fact that, like, that Murphy seems like she's going to play a, a little bit of a larger role in this one. So that's good. So you said in the previous recording, our recording of Winter Night, that you weren't sure how much a villain Marcone was because he seems just so like amicable a, a little bit. Like he, he, he's more of a frenemy than a villain was, was your yeah. impression. So did that kind of continue through this one? Yeah, for sure. I mean, he's, he's out there defending little girls who also really don't like the power of the universe, but you know, he's, he's out there still kind of defending what's right for the most part. So and in this one, Harry's going to actually have to defend Marcone. So the way that that happens is Harry summons Toot Toot, our, our resident pizza lover. Uh, the Za Lord summons him. Uh, Toot Toot's grown up a little bit, so that's fun to see. Uh, but then Mab comes in and interrupts him and shows Harry the vision of Marcone and the building. And we learn that Marcone's been kidnapped. And one of the favors that Harry owes Mab from back in the day is going to happen here. And she tells him that she that he needs to rescue Marcone. And she also says, hey, you should be my winter knight once again. And Harry says, yeah, yeah, no, thank you. I don't want to do that. And right as this happens, then we have the, the Gruffs interrupting again. The Gruffs are getting uh, slowly more and more um, of, of a threat. These Gruffs come in with automatic weapons. And luckily, Thomas comes in and rescues Harry in his Hummer. So... I thought this was funny because this book was written like back in 2008 or so when Hummers were all the rage and Thomas has one. Hummers were a big thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You got like Arnold Schwarzenegger driving around California in a Hummer while he's talking about how important the environment is. It's great. This was a, this was a very interesting time. Yeah. If, if you had a Hummer, you were way cool at this time. This was kind of like my, these were my high school years. I think there were a few kids who were rich and had Hummers and they flexed those hard. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. I think there was one girl who had a pink Hummer, right? She had the Barbie Hummer? No, she had a Barbie, but I thought it was like a Barbie truck. I thought it was like a lifted like F-150 or something. It was something like that. If it wasn't a Hummer, it was it was something of kind of the same vein. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And when she park it in like the... It was, was it the handicap spot? I think it was that she would park it in. Like somehow she managed to get like some special accommodation for it. SMH on the Barbie Hummer. Yeah, yeah SMH. On, yeah, it's funny because it's funny how stuff like that just sticks with you. Both of us remember it very well from high school. Like just this entitled person rocking up with a pink, pink car like that. And and Butcher obviously realizes this as well and puts it into his book because this is an iconic, but also kind of like a deep cut of, of culture back then. Like it's just a type of car, but. It was, it was so uh, pervasive that it made it into these books. So that I really like how he does that. Just interweaves all of the, you know, all of the pop culture type things. Not even pop culture, but regular culture. Yeah. Yeah. I also like. I, I find it funny when because um, Harry, Harry he just kind of has like this gritty personality, right? Where he he doesn't expect much like creature comforts, and then he's like riding the Hummer. He's like, oh, actually, these like air conditioned seats are nice. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. It's like so, a little bit better than the Blue Beetle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he's like, doesn't want to admit to himself that he likes these things, but, you know, they're nice. Yeah, so he's, he's a grumpy old man to, to an extent. Yeah. <laughs> so the plot continues as Fix, who's the summer knight, shows up and threatens Harry through Tatiana. If he helps Mab, Thomas and Harry take him down. They, they realize that, you know, Fix is kind of, um, under a bit of a gaze here to uh, he, he's compelled to do this so there's kind of this weird competition with Summer that's happening and uh, it doesn't quite make sense Harry outsmarts Summer a little bit using um, using Little Chicago and Mister he puts it in like a, a catnip bag and makes Mister like bat it around Little Chicago so that gets uh, that, that gets the gruffs off his trail so a little smart way to use some of the magic that he has and then Harry and Thomas go to investigate Marcone's gym slash brothel called Executive Priority Help. And they, they find, um, they, they run into a confrontation between some of Marcone's lieutenants. So not only are the magical communities 
going after Harry, but now this dude named Torelli, who sounds just like an Italian gangster, is trying to move in on Marcone in his absence. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that, like, as powerful as Marcona is, he still has, like, inviting in his organization and people that are, like, looking to, to take advantage of the situation. Which seems like a legitimate gangster thing. Like, if you were running a, a, a mob family, that's what you would expect to have happen. At least that's what yeah. TV tells me I should expect to have happen. <laughs> <laughs> Steve has been, like, as, like, a special investigative, like, reporter for, for the mobs. Yeah, that's that's my other side hustle. <laughs> <laughs> so not only are the the mortals having problems here, but we're going to add another supernatural element as the Denarians get involved. So Harry and Thomas find Hendrix and Guard, who are both wounded. These are Thomas. These are Marcone's lieutenants, and as they help them, the Denarians attack. So they claim that hey, this is a private thing going on with Marcone, butt out, but. Harry obviously can't do this, and he fights off this new denarian that he calls Mantis Girl. He gets this like electric chain and uses it against her, and then Thomas actually kills another one, and then they all escape in the Hummer, and they head to the Carpenters, which is always like the last bastion of safety. And as they do so, uh, Thomas has picked up one of the coins. Luckily, his hand is gloved, and Harry just kind of bags it for now. So, you know, Harry's got a coin. That's going to be important, probably. You would expect it to be, but then again, he just like, I don't know. These, these coins seem like the end of the world, like when they were first introduced, and now they're just kind of like, eh, got another coin. So there's 30 of them total, and later on they're, they're going to be used as part of the, the, the plot to uh, as a ransom for Ivy, who's been kidnapped. And yeah, I guess you're kind of right. Like they do seem like, oh my gosh, if you have a coin, every everything's ending. But Harry has survived his encounter with the coin against all odds. And now there's just more of them lying around. Maybe we don't think they're quite as scary as we did at first. Right. Yeah. I don't know. It's still like Harry still treats it like it's a serious thing though. Like you, you, you know, like, don't touch that Thomas, you know, puts in his box. Yeah. Right. Like we wouldn't trust Thomas to be able to handle it. Harry apparently has overcome the coin, but right. no one else would be able to. <laughs> and that sounds like that never happened, apparently. So maybe maybe this is hinting to like another special power that Harry has. Right. Maybe. And and speaking of coins, so once we get to the carpenters, Sonya is there. Sonya is one of the Knights of the Cross, and he has a cool backstory that we get. He used to be a denarian. He was a coined monster. And Shiro, you know, of of the noble sacrifice back in book five, saved him back at the time. His sword is still lying around. Harry needs to give that away to someone. And we also learned that both Shiro and Sonya were descendants of ancient kings. So I think Sonya especially was a descendant of Saladin, which is cool. You know, we have some actual history being interwoven into the magic. So we've got fairy tales, we've got pop culture, we've got real history. This book just has it all. Yeah, I mean... I, I think it was also interesting that um, that Harry told Molly to start looking at her family history. So I don't know if it's Molly that's thinking about, you know, like being a sword bearer or maybe uh, Molly's mom. I don't know. Who do you, who do you think? Well, I'm not going to tell you who I think because I've, I'm current on this series. <laughs> but but who do you think? <laughs> yeah, I would say it's either Molly or what's, what's her mom's name again? Charity. Um, Charity, there you go. Of course, because of course it is. But yeah, yeah, and and Charity is already an accomplished fighter, so that could make sense. Well, I guess we will see. So the plot, as the plot continues, Harry tricks the White Council. He calls them in as guard, who is Marcone's assistant and also a Valkyrie, a, a warrior of the upcoming apocalypse. We'll see what happens there. Um, she, so she's a Valkyrie, and she wants Harry to call in the White Council. Harry does so, and he tricks them by leading them to believe that Mab will close the Never Never unless they help the, unless they help to find Marcone, and that's going to be bad for them because they need the Never Never access and the fight with the Red Court that's ongoing and is kind of in the background. And Harry sets up a meeting with the Archive and with uh, Lucio, who is the I'm not sure if I said that right, but she is like the the head warden 
from the, that was introduced back in Deadbeat. And so they meet up at Max, which is neutral ground, the cool pub, and Murphy and Molly are along. They kind of discuss Murphy's involvement in things and her role in the, in the police. And, and this, we haven't seen Murphy a whole lot in the previous two books. I mean, she's been around, but hasn't been developed quite as much as we have here. So Ben, like, what are you thinking of kind of Murphy's role in all of this at this point? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was really cool how um, Murphy kind of, you know, when the big graph appears, totally defends Harry's honor and like says, you know, like uses the fact that she's not a part of the courts, like to kind of wield some power um, and and threaten the graph. So that was that was awesome. I think that for being immortal and for having like a very limited understanding of how all these things works, that's very impressive that Murphy's able to navigate all the you know the fine print of the of the wizarding rules to to come out victorious in this situation. That was like a little bit unbelievable to me, but it was still cool to watch her um, defend Harry like that. I think her and Marcon are really good foils for each other. They're two mortals that have access to, I mean, I guess Harry's mortal as well. So maybe I did just two unmagical people that have, that, you know, that are part of this world. They don't necessarily know everything that's going on. Marcon kind of takes one route, which is the, you know, more of like the chaotic good, eh, maybe not even good, but chaotic neutral, and he is he's not law, law. He, he doesn't care for the law at all, but Murphy, on the other hand, is very much like on the lawful good side, and, and needs to defend what is right and what is good, and so it's nice to see her shine in moments like these. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. She's able, especially able to, like, use the law, even though it's not the law that she's got to follow, to, like, come out on top, so that's pretty cool. So speaking of Murphy, she gets hit by some uh, Torelli gunmen that come in, Marcone's lieutenant that's trying to take over, and they all head back to the Carpenters. Murphy's kind of helped out by, by Michael. She's not in you know too dire of straits here, but uh, we also get some information about the whole situation with, uh, with the Dendarians. Apparently Tessa, who is Nicodemus's ex, is in, in town as well, and so both of these guys together spells real bad news. And Harry and Michael get in this argument over faith. I think this is one of the, the stronger parts in the book where Michael explains that, you know, he thinks things are going to be, is, are going to work out because he has faith in a higher power and he has faith in what is good. And Harry just kind of struggles with this because he's seen so many bad things happen and he just kind of struggles to rectify what's going on in the world. And I think that's something that we as humans always kind of struggle with. And so this was a, a stronger moment in the book. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I think that, yeah, I mean, the whole book, especially when, whenever Michael's there, you always have like this tension between that and and Harry, where it's like the faith versus like the realism that, like, you know. So, and, and but we know by the end of this that um, that is really going to require some some faith on Michael's part. Well, let's just say so. Yeah, and he continues to have faith, which is. Really strong. It's going to be a really strong thing, kind of going into the the future books as well. And honestly, like I've said this before, Dresden Files can sometimes be a little bit pulpy and a little bit just kind of fun. But there are also really strong moments like this, which stop, which make you stop and, and consider, you know, just what's going on in your life, etc. And I think there's a lot of value to that. And fantasy books have that. And when people diss on fantasy and say it's just you know pulpy fiction and doesn't have any value, that kind of uh, you know, sets me off a little bit because moments like these uh, have really helped me in my life reading this kind of stuff. Yeah, totally agree. So the plot continues and we go to Union Station, which is, it's fun to see these big time locations in Chicago. We've talked before about our Dresden tour of Chicago that Fantology is going to do one day totally. in, in the near future. So tune in for that and we're going to head to Union Station to recap the battle here that happens with uh with the hobs which are like hobgoblin type things and they can summon this unnatural darkness harry and michael are there to try to get a hair sample from our cone to uh chase him down and they get into this fight with them harry hits the sprinklers smartly which kind of dissipates 
their magic. Michael kills a bunch of them and you know shows how powerful he is. But then the huge gruff appears again, and then everyone kind of fights because the gruff is winter, or the gruff is summer, and the hobs are winter. And then they all get into it, and then and then Harry tricks them using the security spell on the storage locker they're trying to get to. This was a fun moment. We've got a lot of different action going on here. Yeah, I agree. I really didn't follow like the whole sprinkler because Harry also has to like use magic in combination with the water, and like apparently that took away the darkness. I I didn't understand it. I like went back and re-listened to it to see if I could figure it out. I still didn't really understand it. Well, so he so, hits the sprinklers to dissipate the the fey magic. Well, but like, why does water dissipate it? Because of plot reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, like water and iron, it, it, it works. Kind of, I don't know. That was a little weird. It was, it was a little forced to me. I'm like, I feel like if you create, you create a problem and then you should have a like fulfilling way to solve that problem, not just, oh, sprinklers. I, don't know. I, I think don't know. in the backstory of just all of these, you know, fey stories from, from you know, years prior, it's fine for Butcher to draw upon water as something that dissipates magic because it's been done before. It's not like he's the first one to say, okay, yeah, water's going to dissipate it. it. It works, but I do see what you're saying as well because he just as easily could have said, oh, water doesn't do it because I'm the one creating the world. Yeah, I don't know. I I just, I guess I was looking for some cooler way to resolve it. Um, but the fact that they use kind of like the security spell... I guess I was also wondering, because like, it, it's not really clear what happens. Like, there's some big explosion, and the gruff like, doesn't have a leg anymore or something. But like, is it just like pure magical energy that wouldn't have been noticed if it was opened in another way? Or, I mean, what? Uh, you know, like, yeah, I don't remember the exact details, but I guess my impression was just that there was this you know, magical energy that was set on the storage locker, and if you didn't open it correctly, then it was going to, a bomb was going to go off, and so Harry set that, and it, it used it on the gruff. Well, so, to kind of fill in a little bit more details, but, I mean, it's been a few weeks since I read it, too, but, like, um, when, when she was, when she was, when Guard was telling him about it, she said, don't stand directly in front of it. And so, like, Harry kind of, like, timed it so that he could open it, and, like, the gruff would be standing in front of it. And so then, like, it takes out the gruff. But, like, I mean, you're in the middle of like a public space, you know, <laughs> you can't just expect to go open this and have like this massive bomb go off, like, you know, like just any day. Yeah, uh, well, I guess we can, because that, that's how the magical community doesn't care too much about what the, uh, what the regular humans think, what the muggles think. That's true. I guess, yeah. That's that's one of the bigger themes of Dresden Files is that people don't believe what's right in front of them and there's all this magic happening, but people are like, yeah, yeah, whatever. It's just a bomb. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Yeah, maybe. It, mm -hmm. it just seemed like also like she was keeping these things. Maybe she wasn't using them all the time, but like they're like, you know, hair, hair like basically whoever she needs to have leverage on, she needs like access to those things. So I don't know. To me, it, it was kind of confusing. This, I enjoyed all the action, but I just didn't think that it was kind of deserved at this part. But So putting a bomb on your secure stuff doesn't seem to make sense is what you're saying? Yeah, like I could see like you open it up and like there's like a little poison flow dart that like goes out like Indiana Jones style or something. But sure. this kind of large scale carnage of uh, any time you want to access your phone. <laughs> Yeah, it just seems like Green God level security, like the the basement of Green God, so not just, I don't know, anyway. Okay, so maybe a little bit of overkill it, and not the smartest way to handle it. Yeah, that's that's a fair criticism, I suppose. But as, as the plot continues, so Harry grabs the box with Marcone's hair, and then he meets up with Ivy and Kincaid and, uh, and Lucio, who are all there, fortunately, at the end of the battle, so they don't take part in the battle, but uh, they are there to meet up with Harry and Michael afterwards. And, uh, and Lucio's hot and maybe hitting on Harry. So that's a thing, as always, right? 
Uh, and then our, then everyone's going to kind of like meet up and we do our little war council thing. And we all head off to the aquarium, the big aquarium in Chicago called Shed Aquarium. And we meet up with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus requests a private conversation with Harry. And he seems to know about the Black Council and the attack in Arctic's tour that's been a mystery since Small Favor. And it seems like maybe some of the Denarians are part of the Black Council. We're definitely not sure. But then Harry realizes he's being stalled and that Ivy is the real target, the archive that stores all of you know, the, the memories. Um, and so as this action begins, we just kind of go from one climax to another. But I remember this aquarium part uh, really well. This, this was a highlight of the series for me. Yeah, I agree. Um, super fun. And I, okay, I'm just going to say, I don't really love, um, oh, what's her, what's, what's her name? Ivy, what, the archive. Yeah. I don't, I don't love the character because I just feel like I don't real like there hasn't been as much time spent developing this super important character as I wish that there would have. And this is, I guess is when she is developed, but right. it seemed like her and Harry are mutually willing to like give each other's lives up for each other. And I just don't see that happening after like the limited interactions that they have. You're kind of I mean, struggling to see the, the importance that should, like you've been told how important she is, but you're like, I right. haven't really been showed how important she is. Yeah, and you've been shown that she has power, and she like, and I guess like theoretically, like having all the information in the world is powerful. But like, why is this important? Like, or why does this even exist? Also, like, again, I know that Harry gives her name, but like, for like this, I don't know. I guess. I enjoy the character because I I can see how being in a little girl's body with a little girl's mind, but with all the information of the world, that makes for an interesting character. Um, but I just don't feel like the character has been given the screen time that, that she deserves to really have this outsized role in the plot right now. I think that's a fair criticism. I could see Dresden Files existing without the archive and doing just fine. But uh, she is important in, in this book, and it kind of develops her. And let's see what happens in the next ones, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So this fight, the Denarians are kind of setting up some kind of spell. Harry manifests this new ability. He creates this giant silvery hand, kind of like uh, Voldemort creating the new hand for Pettigrew a little bit. But Harry can control this and uses it to fight. But it really drains him a lot, so we're not sure what this is, but it seems kind of cool. The Denarians use this gas, which affects Ivy more because she's a child, and it works, and they take Ivy. Harry breaks the glass, flooding the entire aquarium, which is a nice climax, but uh, this is a fail for our heroes because the Denarians definitely win the battle of Shed Aquarium. Ivy and Marcone are taken, but luckily we have the coins, so now the idea is we're going to make a trade. We're going to trade the coins for Ivy and Marcone, because it'd be way bad if these guys got coined by the Denarians and Michael and Sanya are not okay with this, but we kind of decide that like this is the, the best way to go. And then Nicodemus comes out to negotiate, but he actually refuses the deal. Harry throws in the sword as well. So we're gonna kind of see what happens here. And then once again, we're getting in, into another climax. So there's a, there's a lot of action going on here. Um, what was your sense of, of what was going to go on here with all these negotiations, Ben? Lots of action. I I thought that the sword was a nice touch. If it wasn't for the sword, I would have been like, eh, whatever. You know, like, there's the coins are important to Michael, not so important to Harry. Turns out not so important to Nicodemus. But once you get the sword, because I thought it was interesting, because, like, they're like, you know, the, the coins are just important in so much as they help Nicodemus bring about the end of the world, but now that he has Ivy, he can do that. But the thing is, like, like the swords will survive and still kind of continue to be a thorn in his side. So, like, the chance to eliminate one of those, I thought was, like, a believable intent for him. Yeah. Yeah, the, the sword, and this is going to be a continue, continual thing going on as Nicodemus tries to take out the swords. We'll kind of see what happens with those in, in the future books. So another plot thing that has happened, if there's not enough going on already, Apparently Harry's mind has been tampered with a little bit. Yeah. And they actually figure out what's happening here. Well, they don't really figure out till the very end, but 
this was something where it's like, okay, there's already so much going on here. And now also Harry's mind is being messed with. I don't know. I, th I thought maybe we didn't really need this. Yeah, super weird. This was like, I feel like Butcher's attempt to like do that unreliable narr narrator. Thing. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Um, but yeah, like what did it add to the plot? You know, it kind of went back and, and explained a few weird decisions. But like, who, like, was it Mav? Or who, who it was it? Matt. Matt, yeah, Matt, Matt did. Matt. Yeah, but why? Like, and, and about the blasting rod, why the blasting rod? Confusing, super confusing. And, but I did enjoy the fact that, like, um, it showed how important Molly was to him, where she was able to kind of, like, uh, like help him in this regard. So, yeah, yeah. She, yeah she has some uh, unique magical abilities here that, that are going to help out. Yeah, I don't, gosh, I don't remember the exact details. We're going to have to go on Patreon and, uh, and update you guys on what these details are because I think we're butchering it here. But uh, yeah, I, I do agree with you that maybe it wasn't quite necessary. Dude, did you intend for the for the butcher pun there, or did that was that just all natural? No, I've been doing that for every Dresden review. Whenever we mess up, I always say butcher. <laughs> maybe I'm okay. Fair. It's it's a phantology <laughs> deep cut. <laughs> Apparently, I'm so deep in it. Yeah, I'm on another level here with my uh, <laughs> with my podcasting narration ability. <laughs> so the meeting that's happened. So we we finally have a we're, we're set up for the final climax of Small Favor, and we're going to meet at this island. And as we go to the island, it's strangely familiar to Harry. So what is this? This seems <laughs> this seems strange. This is explained as well. This is better. And I can give you some solid reasons for this one. At least it is quite important going forward. But we get to the island and we try to rescue Ivy, but really we just kind of all fight pretty quickly. And then luckily Guard comes in on a helicopter, I think blasting some music and rescues everyone. But uh, as they are, as they're, uh, you know, getting evacuated, Michael's climbing up the ladder to get out of there and he's shot several times. They get him out of there, but it's looking way bad. And this was a moment where you're like, oh, snap. Like, this is someone we actually care about, and he may be dead. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was intense. And it was also intense because, like, Harry tried to, like, put him on the helicopter rope to ensure that he survived because he saw a guard kind of, like, looking a little bit funny. Right. Him. Right, and because she can... She she has this ability to like see someone who's about to die, kind of like this foresight. Yeah, so it's interesting, but it kind of goes to show that you can't change fate. You end up when you try, you end up playing into fate's hands. So I thought that was I thought it was cool. I never really believed that Michael was going to die, but I mean, I don't know. Just because Dresden Files hasn't up the stakes to that level yet. So until like until any book ups the stakes, you, you don't believe that the stakes exist. So Yeah, that that's fair. I mean you said in White Knight that you thought that uh, La Shell being killed off was the first major death and she was uh, you know a pretty ancillary character. So we, we right. haven't seen any any big ones drop yet. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> so Harry at this point, Harry loses it. I feel like it's how it changes. I just have like this, uh, this like child over my head of like everybody knows something I don't. <laughs> yeah, you're a Dresden noob. It's okay. We, like, we, we appreciate like, your... Like, we, Game of Thrones or something. Yeah, yeah. So we actually watched, I remember watching The Red Wedding with you and you hadn't seen it. You hadn't read the books. So you didn't know what was, what was coming. And so I was, we were watching it like trying to film you or something as... <laughs> And I think your mouth just kind of dropped and you like slumped down during that episode. Yeah, that was, that was big. Okay, yeah. okay, anyway, that's that. Yeah, so as we get to the, to the wrap up here, so Harry kind of loses it and he kills Tessa with this supercharged firebolt. Whenever Harry gets, whenever Harry's emotions get too riled up, he can blast off some big magic. And then the eldest Gruff shows up. So finally we have the culmination of the Gruffs, and the Eldest Gruff is not as big as you might think. He's kind of this diminutive wizard type, but he has three stoles of 
senior council wizards on his shoulder. So he's killed three senior white council members. And then Harry is able to trick him to buy him off by using his summer leaf token favor thing. To say, hey, go get me a donut and also make sure there are sprinkles on it. I mean, this was funny, but maybe a little cheesy. <laughs> I don't know. To me, this was super fun. Um, I don't know. This just kind of encapsulates like, what makes like kind of the magic magic sauce that uh, Dresden Files has. So I enjoyed it. Yeah, Harry I never... Enjoyed the, like, the way, I enjoyed the way that they were like speaking super formally to each other when they were like, setting up the deal. Right. So that, you know, so... And you think the whole time Harry's just kind of doing this tongue in cheek and he never takes things too seriously. Like his, one of his best friends has just been shot, but he's still able to joke here. He, he's asking out women, you know, like he asked out Luke, Lucio kind of right as all this is about is happening. So he's able to always keep a level head. Very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. 10 points to Harry right there. 10 points to Gryffindor and Harry hops on the boat uh, he has this showdown with Nicodemus. He chokes him with his uh, with his noose one more time. He loses the coins. They all escape. Harry jumps overboard. Thomas and Murphy rescue him. Murphy draws uh, Phil Philolachius, the sword, the sword of faith, just a tiny bit, and the light shoots out and blinds uh, uh, Deidre, one of the Denarians. And so hmm, maybe there's some hints that Murphy might be taking up a sword because she's able to wield it. She doesn't actually pull it out. She just pulls it out of the scabbard enough to make a difference. So maybe that adds to your sword theory. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I for sure was in the Murphy camp until this, but she kind of um, refuses it at the end. So she does refuse it. She says she just wants to, you know, be a mortal officer of the law, but I don't know, like maybe the sword kind of chooses the wizard a little bit. We'll see. Yeah. Another going, going full on Harry Potter here at the end of the podcast. So they all head off to the hospital to kind of wrap up. Michael's in surgery, seriously wounded. His life is in, in balance. And Harry's pretty ticked off at this point. And going back to the conversations he's had about faith previously, he goes to the chapel of the hospital. He's really angry with God. And he has this theological talk with this janitor, Jake the janitor, who appears to be a lot wiser than you might expect from a janitor. And he references this helping hand, which ties back obviously to this magic that Harry did with silvery hand prior. And so this was a, a fun conversation and I, I really like these themes in this one. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you're kind of left with uh, who the heck this janitor guy is. Um, it, kind of paint, it kind of alludes to like the, the fact that like there's all this stuff going on behind the scenes that Harry's not really just kind of just tangentially, tangentially aware of them. So, and we do know who the janitor is by the end of the book. Map comes in and and drops the truth bomb here. She she kind of um, explains a little bit of the, of the backstory but, of what's but, going on. So so the janitor Jake is Uriel the angel. He's a, he's a literal angel. Oh. Okay. okay. Apparently you missed sure. that in your in your read through, <laughs> and the magic yeah. that Harry's been that doing. Right? Yeah, it's in this book, and this is what Mab also explains that she's the one who altered his his memory and took the blasting rod. But yeah, uh, she also explains yeah about the janitor, and she says that he uh, she, Harry still owes her one more favor, and he, she had him do all this because he needed her to defend her accords and also get revenge for the Arctis Tor attack. So this is some backstory on what's going on with the Black Council. Maybe Michael survives, but he may need, you know, some serious assistance for the rest of his life. Unclear how he'll do in PT. And then Sonya gives Harry Michael's sword as well. So now Harry has two swords, if one wasn't enough to entrust Harry Dresden with. And Murphy turns down being a knight. And then we also learned the magic Harry was doing was called soul fire, which depletes his soul to use. And it's the power of angels, but it's super powerful, but he can't use it too much or, you know, he could exhaust himself entirely. So soul fire is cool. And Harry's magical repertoire is being built up. Yeah. 
But we don't, like, he doesn't really know how he did it, though, right? He just, like, summoned more energy. I don't know. To me, he was still kind of confused about it, so. Well, Uriel, I, I Uriel is giving him this power. That's what he's saying when he says, like, we gave you a helping oh. hand. He's now, you know, oh. being, like, favored by angels. Okay, fair That's enough. how I took it, at least. Yeah, I mean, to me, like, this is kind of a theme of one of the things I dislike about the drone is the fact that, like, at the end of the book, you're, you have to be given, like, this explanation of things that happened. And I end up just kind of zoning out during it. Cause I'm like, if I didn't figure it out during the book, then, like, I hate the fact that I have to be, like, explicitly told it. It kind of just seems like, and this, a few bucks. So. so yeah, Ben, that sounds like that was your worst of the best. Like you really liked the plot, but at the same time you're thinking it could have been more integrated to the point where you didn't have to have that whole full on explanation at the end of the book. And yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. I, I'll say that's mine as well. Um, to, to wrap up here, I also mentioned that Harry and Lucio get together and this ex she explains his like wizard site that's coming in with the island. So this is something that's going to be important into his future. And that is the book. That's our review of Small Favor. If you like Phantology, check us out at Phantology Books online at www.phantology.com. We have a Discord server that we'd love for you to chat with us and correct our mistakes, which we probably made in, in this recording. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you are forgiving of us we are just simple first-time readers that are that are doing our best here if you if you like what we're doing though um, we also have a patreon that has some different tiers we're live streaming again in a couple days actually tomorrow we're live streaming and covering news from august from the month of august so go ahead and check that out and and yeah so th so that's a wrap thanks ben for joining it's been a review of Small Favor by Jim Butcher, and we'll see you guys next time.